Joe, you know, funny times, um, huge challenges in farming, and I suppose, you know, the first time in 30 years that there's no ploughing, what a change. Uh, the dreaded COVID-19 and what, what it has done to farming in particular, the impact of that, where do you, where do you see that going? Where do you see us going in COVID-19? Well, first of all, as you said there about the ploughing, and uh, it was the pinnacle of the year for, for us all, really. And it was even apart from the business side of it at all, John, what I found, you know, from being in, whether it was the Farming Independent Stand or the IFA Stand over recent years, people that mightn't even have gone to anywhere else during the year, the ploughing was the place that they went. And that's where they went into the stand. They knew they were going to meet John there or whoever else there. And they'd have the chat and they might have a carload come into the ploughing and you know people miss that and the, that's all the, kind of the psychological side of it as, as well as everything else um and it's all as a result of what your question is really about the COVID 19. and you know the figures at the moment uh, there's no point in pussyfooting around them they're they're scary when you see when you hear them gone up into the hundreds again um you know thankfully the deaths are seem to be fairly well controlled but uh and you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. And, you know, people might say, are the government handling it right? And, um, you know, what is handling it right? You know, there's one sector of society down on top of them if the restrictions are too much. And then if the restrictions are being eased, there's another section of society down on top of them. So it's not easy. And I don't know the answers to it. It has had a huge effect, you know, whether it's on show days, whether it's on, you know, club championship matches or the the ga right across right across the spectrum i think from a farming point of view obviously it has had a huge effect but you know right from the start as farmers we've been kind of i suppose luckier than most in the sense that for last march for example you know i had friends that was getting up at seven o'clock in the morning um joining the traffic going into work they were maybe working in a factory to be a lad or two always within shouting distance of them or that you could have the bit of crack with you they were having lunch with them they were going home in the evening grabbing their hurdle or their football and their gear and they were going training um back that night maybe into bed and that was their day and they went from that to being more you know housed up in their, their yeah absolutely and whereas as farmers we were able to get up we were able to go out calf cows lamb yos feed them milk them uh whatever else uh, put out fertilizer do the silage and the work kind of went on and I think you know the markets was the one thing I was afraid of from the very start in case they'd be affected but the markets for the agri product uh, for the mainstream agricultural commodities whether you're talking about dairy beef or sheep they've held up reasonably well we've been able to sell the product which was most important of all the milk lorry was able to continue to come into the yard I know the marts and that they've had to work but we've all had to work our way around certain aspects of it but trading was able to continue um so you know as long as that lasts at least we'll be able to eke out a, a future and hopefully in the meantime this famous uh cure that they're talking about you know that they'll come up with something well it'd be great if they did but i suppose you know the COVID the one thing farming can be a very lonely lonely place and as you said isolated a lot of small farmers are isolated but realistically when you look at the price of sheep at the moment are going well um, I think the beef men, as you well know, are getting a hard time and uh, there's difficulties there. Um, you know, selling beef at 350, 360 is a bit of a joke, really. And uh, I don't know where it's going. What do you feel or where do you think it's heading for the next 12 months? If you'd asked me this earlier on, at the end of last year, I'd have looked ahead and I'd have said uh, there was a positive year ahead because you had the China equation, uh, you had grown uh, a growth in demand and you had the supplies within a, a certain parameter under control. Um, you know, that has been kind of hit back from a, from a beef point of view. Um, it's, it's difficult when you look at the international markets, it's difficult to see any massive rise in beef price. And if you take even last year, for instance, the first 11 months of last year, and we talked about the price in Ireland, and we had a bad price in Ireland last year. But if you looked at the six countries that we put in 90% of our beef into, yeah. they averaged for the first 11 months a price of 355 per kilo. Our price in Ireland for the first 11 months averaged at 354 per kilo. Now, I know it doesn't lessen our pain, 
to think that the rest of them had a similar pain. But that's what I mean when I say it wasn't in the marketplace and it's not really in the marketplace. And what does that come back down to? I think a lot of the time, our first target is generally always the factories, but the retailers have more power than the factories. And the retailers, if you look any week on the paper, they have a 33% reduction on beef price. They have a 50% reduction on the price of a, ro a roast beef. And that's to get footfall through. Uh, because I saw figures about six months ago, maybe a bit more, that the average person going into a, a supermarket, if they have meat in their trolley, they spend on average four times more than the person without meat in their trolley. Right. So they're going in to do a shop, but the meat is the staple. And that's why the, it's kind of a, and I won't even say a loss leader for the, for the retailers. They're willing to take a smaller margin on that in order to get the people in, into the shops. And that's where the problem lies. And I would acknowledge the work that Commissioner Hogan did on that during his term as Agricultural Commissioner with the um, Unfair Trading Practices, the Agri-Markets Task Force report. And I think we need to build on that. There were certain aspects of that that had to be left out in order to get it through the Commission, uh, the Parliament and the European Council. And one of those aspects that they left out was a ban on below cost selling. But, you know, it can be reviewed in three years, three years from the onset. And I think that's one area that we and we need a retail ombudsperson here as well. But I suppose a short question that, you know, anyone looking at this will be thinking of the plough in 2020. They didn't get there. It was the flagship for uh, all the agricultural, whether to be you know, whatever you were doing, the ploughing was the answer to, to meet people, see people. Where do you think beef prices will be at the end of the year? And I suppose the real big question is, what effect will Brexit have on the Irish economy? Like, we're treading on very thin ice for the last few days, and Lord knows where that's going to go. But, you know, the British government don't seem to be uh, following into in line with what they agreed going back 12 months ago, last October, I think. What's your, your opinion of the outcome of this Brexit thing? Mm. Well, first of all, you mentioned there at the start about farmers have been vital to JFC. I think the likes of JFC is vital to farmers as well. You know, when you talk about um, workload on farm and to try and like every farmer is trying to reduce the workload. I've come across so many people to say even your calf feeder and how that has reduced the workload on farms. Do you know, yeah. I even remember growing up, John, as a young lad and trying to fight with a calf to put his head down a bucket to drink the milk. The, the bucket that, we'll that, the really. that you brought onto the late, late revolutionized all that and you've grown from that. But no, like we can joke about it, but yeah. it's so important that there's efficiencies within farms and work efficiency because, you know, one of the toughest things on farms is to get labor, yeah. you know, so, but, you know, your, your, your main question was about Brexit. Yes. I was only six weeks in as president of the IFA when Brexit arrived. And right from the start, it was going to be about damage limitation. There was no good aspect to Brexit, no matter how you looked at it. It was damage limitation. And God, John, when, when you're trying to do a deal with someone, the least that you'd expect them to have and the most thing that you want them to have to get a deal through is a word. And if they go back on that word, it's, yeah. it's impossible to do a deal, do you know? And that just seems to be the way. And this isn't about bashing the, the British or that we've worked very closely with the NFU in Northern Ireland, in England, Wales and Scotland. And like we, they appreciate just like us that a good deal for us is a good deal for them. We don't want to be competing with uh, Brazilian beef on the English shelves or more of it, should I say. Mm -hmm but they don't want to be competing with Brazilian beef on the English shelves either, yeah. do you know? So that's how we've worked very closely with them. Um, and what we've always asked for is that the deal that would be done would retain the closest possible trading relationship between the EU and the UK, but that the UK market would be maintained. There's no point having access to a market if it's going to be undermined by cheaper foreign imports produced to lower standards. And, you know, at the moment, you're probably closer to that than you are to what we'd like to see. Um, and, you know, I, I've, I've been in touch with some of the farmers in the UK in recent weeks, just urging them to keep on, keep the pressure on the government that it, they need to do a deal with the EU. From an Irish perspective, you know, one figure stands out, well, a couple of figures stands out in my mind, John, that for the last four years, whether it was the Minister for Agriculture, the Irish Government, Board BIA, or any of the marketing boards, you were allowing England, uh, the UK, to continue along, 
but you weren't putting massive resources into it. The resources were going into other countries around the world. We are sending food, agri products to 180 countries around the world. So we were going into the countries trying to maximize the markets we had there and create new markets. And still in 2016, Sorry, in 2017, 35% of our agri-food exports went to the UK. A year later, with the focus elsewhere around the world, like I'm after saying, 37% of our agri-food exports went to the UK. So geography and market returns will dictate where you do your trade uh, in the main. And the UK, obviously. Plus the fact that, you know, you and your staff produce a material to satisfy a market that you're going into. Farmers' investments, processors' investments over the last 30 years, uh, beyond that, has been to supply a market like the UK. You know, different markets have different tastes and different requirements, and it's difficult to change overnight. So when you're set up to supply a market, you'd like to be able to continue to supply that market. And that's what we'd like to do as, as farmers. They're our best, uh, our best market. And when you look at, you know, if you take individual countries, the UK and America are two of our top countries to export stuff to. And you have Boris Johnson and uh, and Donald, and you know, it's difficult to know where you're not going too, with- Not with two simple guys. No, they're not, they're not. And you know, I, I, probably the last, last question is in Joe Healy, IFA, synonymous, running around for, how many years were you in, in, in that position? Four years, Four years, IFA president, yeah. And uh, you know, as president and all the buzz that went with it, Right, you're back home on your fair milking uh, cows at the moment. What's the next step for Joe Healy? Is there a Europe? Is there a doll seed? Or where, <laughs> did you, where do you see your bill go? <laughs> the next step, John, is when I go home from here, I'm hoping to bale a bit of silage, uh, uh, the last of the silage. Um, I enjoyed every second of the four years. There, were, there was a huge amount of challenges and we haven't even touched on the likes of climate change or that. But in that four years, you know, I, I take a bit of, pleasure in leading a team that delivered 600 million euros extra for Irish farmers, whether that was the beep or the beam or the sheep welfare or there were so many other uh, things. Um, and, you know, I think that that's what we have to be very careful of. If the market isn't going to pay for top quality food, well, then the EU, uh, the, the bureaucrats in Brussels has to ensure that farmers are conti continue to be able to produce top quality pro food at affordable prices for the consumers. Um, I've always loved farming. Everything that I've ever done in all my life has always involved agriculture, whether that was managing Atherai Mart, chairman of Atherai Mart, shearing sheep, writing for the Farming Independent, president of MACRA, president of IFA. At the moment, I'm just coming to the end of being vice president of uh, COPA, the European Farmers Organization. But it has always involved agriculture um, and you know, back uh, dairy farming, uh, milk and cows. I love that job. Want to be. I, 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 I love farming. A real politicians answer to the question I asked you. <laughs> but you asked me where's the next step, and the next, the next step, the next is, step is, 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 is farming. Yeah. Look, at, I have to compliment you for coming down and taking time out to be uh, the only one other than ourselves from Galway that came on the JFC stand 2020. As I said, JFC are innovators and motivators. And I must say that you and, and what you did was excellent for the country and for farming in general. And on behalf of JFC and all our customers and our employees and families, I'd like to compliment you on that and for helping us and making Ireland a better place and making farming better. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, John.